doing it. Yes. The question and answer. I asked her one of my last videos if they have any questions for you. So right. let's go through them. Good. Let's do just exactly that. Let's just take. We're having a Coke here in the shop. Okay. So first question, this is kind of a good one to start and break the ice, is how old were you when you built your first engine and how did it turn out? Well, and I, when you say my first, was that under supervision? Yeah. Oh, oh. when well, I under supervision, well, this, this dates the whole thing here. There was a, a fella, his name is Dick Bowens, B-O-W-N-S, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a uh, flathead. Oh, this guy was the guru on it. So... I would, in his shop a lot, and he showed me how to do flatheads on the thing. Well, the very first one, he said, okay, you've learned enough, go ahead. Well, it didn't make it but a couple of laps. It was a little dirt track there to it, and then he showed me what I had done wrong in it. So then, and as he told me at the time, he said, you don't learn until you break them. And he <laughs> said, when you break them, you'll learn from what you broke. So I think I'm going through that right now. You can relate. It's, it's what it's what do I mean? You, you go to your break something and say, "Okay, I didn't know that before." So now you do. Yeah. Well, we go again. And say, "Well, I didn't know that." Well, now you do. Right. And I was probably, or not probably, I was 12 years old. And uh, wow, that's that's way back in. And then, yeah. Within three years after that, uh, about two and a half to three years, I got under the tutelage of a guy named Fred Miller, and some on it will know. And they'll say, "Yeah, they'll look up Fred Miller." He's dead now. It's a tragic accident, but he was the guru of small block Fords, small block Chevrolets, big block Chevrolets, big block Fords. I mean, he was he was the man. Yeah. So, but he was a uh, oh, he was a hard taskmaster. Really. He did something one time, and he figured you got it. And if you didn't get it, and if you made that error, he's like he just stopped and he'd say, "If you're not going to learn this stuff, I'm not going to be here teaching you." Right. Thank you. Right. Uh, you give me, it's like drinking out of a fire hose. You gave me all this and I can't remember it all. Yeah. Go get it. Study at the house. Huh. Well, his, now he'd fix them and he'd, he'd look right over your shoulder and he was doing something. He'd say, no, 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 no. He's, he's, he's right in your hip pocket all the time. And the first thing done with him, in that day, if you had one that would turn, say, seven or 7,500, like, whew, you'd really done something. And the first one I'd done with him, well, he ran up on his dyno that he had there. It's kind of like a, it wasn't really a dyno, it was just an engine stand. Right. But he'd run, he said, we're going to test it. And he ran to about 72 or 7,300. And I said, okay. And then that was the first living one on thing. And then it went into a uh, round track car. And in that days, they had, uh, they run a Saturday race. And I think it was called Grand National at that time. But it was kind of like the, uh, the ones they have today, you know, when you have, People that participate in the Saturday race and then some in the Sunday race and the NASCAR thing. Well, these, you had, uh, you got certain weight breaks. Like, say, you could run a small cubic inch engine and you got a three or four hundred pound weight break, but you had to really buzz the motor to get it to be competitive. But anyway, it's just a lot of history. And people are probably saying, we don't want to know that. But that was, that was fun to do. And I got to work with the Seven Up team. You know, I bet you didn't even know Seven Up had a racing team. Right. And it did. I got to work with those guys. Yeah. And it was uh it was it was fun. It was a lot of fun. A lot of sleepless nights, but a lot of fun. And you know what everybody always says when if nothing ever breaks, nobody gets the blame. It's like, okay. <laughs> but as soon as something breaks, especially the engine, they say, Who done the engine? Well you can't hide. It's like Right. Whether it's your fault or not, it could have been a, a part failure on the thing. It doesn't matter. It's just you're the engine guy. So on those days, you get to celebrate and say, yes, it done well. Few and far between. Because even though the driver might over everyone, it's okay. He's just trying to keep up. Yep. But if it blows up, on us, on you. It's on, yeah, that's right. <laughs> always. All right, this has been a pretty popular question. And I know your your career just came to an end this past week, right? I mean, yeah, you're retired, yeah, but they yeah, want to know yeah. what you did for your career. I had, actually had two careers in it. Uh, one, I worked for the Norton Company, which is out of Worcester, Mass. And uh, then the second career, uh, a friend of mine, Rick Val, out of Indiana, he and I started a company in uh, end of 1988 called Four Star Products. That sounds kind of corny, but we reasonably call it Four Star Products. We started out with four products, and we thought them to be star performers. Yeah. Plus four star products. I see. Kind of okay. corny, but it. Yeah, yeah. 
And, and then the company grew, 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 grew. And each time we'd go to a new location, we'd say, man, it's a big building. We'll never outgrow this. A couple of years later, man, this place is small. We've outgrown it. And it's on and on and on. We finally, the big one we moved into on 33rd. Like I said, we'll never outgrow this. Well, we did. But then after, you know, 30 some years, some people wanted to buy the business and we said, okay, but we, we manufactured polishes, waxes, compounds, floor cleaners, uh, household products, different things. And mm -hmm. all the formulas were ours. I mean, Rick was a formulator. I've done the, you know, the outside sales and then also the running of the shop, so to speak, but he was the formulator and good products. They're still in operation today. That was, but after I'd sold a company about a year and a half ago, I had kind of volunteered to do machine maintenance for them for a year and a half. Now that just, just ended at the end of this year. This Well, not this year, this past year. Happy day. Well, now you get to focus on... So now, my focus now, although it looks a little busy in here, people would say, not busy, it's cluttered, is hot rodding. It's what I've always wanted to do for since that high is to be able to be dedicated to the hot rod community and stuff that you like about that full time. Well, now you've got the East County Hot Rod Shop. So now then, with the <laughs> East County Hot Rod Shop out there, here it is. So you you get to walk from your house to your hot rod shop. It's right out there. Right. And and I guess the part I like the most about it is, is yeah, that that's the mechanical side of it, but it's the people that's in it. Yeah. Oh, that's what makes it up. And you just don't come by people like that in most of your other industries. But the hot rod thing, it's it's different. That's that's where it is, you know, and that's whew, right. That's a culmination of a dream there, it really is. Mm -hmm. So that was the varied careers on it. And taught college for a while, way back in Asheville, North Carolina, and and now we're what were you teaching there? Metallurgy and machine processes and uh, mainly metallurgy, which is metallurgy is the science of metals, if you will. You know, you take any metal and it, like I say, when you have your finished pieces here, that's all a composition of something. Yeah, you know, you have different ingredients you work with, of course, when I say you work with them, is when they make steel, aluminum, whatever that it is, there's certain products that go into that, raw materials that go into that, of certain mixtures to produce a certain product, much like baking a cake. And they have different heat treating processes on it. It's all different. How you come out with grades five and eights and all this sort of thing and the hardness factors. And I mean, it, it's just, well, it's a whole industry to itself. And a lot of that we gave away. When I say gave away, we sent it to other countries, but oddly enough, some of it's coming back. You know, finally we had to bring it back because yep. you're at their mercy. And the steel industry is coming back some, so. Okay, I like it. Okay, we got Boiler Room Radio asks, if you've ever raced and were you a crew chief? Yes, uh, I mentioned a minute ago about the, the seven up one on it. Yeah. When I first went to work for those guys, uh, was just kind of floor sweeper because you, you're outside looking in, but you want to be in that, you know. So you do whatever's there, you know. You carry tires, you help them change tires. It doesn't matter what it is. And then after a while they say, well, the guy's sticking around, let's give him something to do. Right. And then pretty soon they realize you got certain talents. So after a while, and you have to put your time and grade in. So I got to build engines for him for a while. And after a while he said, you know, hey, when Mike, and that was our uh, main crew chief on the when he's out, would you like to fill in for him? And I said, of course. Well, it, it's like, in the, it looked glamorous. Well, when you step into them shoes, whoo, that's, 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 that's a bee's nest. Be careful what you ask for. That's a bee's <laughs> nest. So, and, and, and you're saying, are you sure? Yeah, it was for 7-Up was our sponsor. And you, you and his small tracks were raced on. And we did go two times down to Charlotte. And boys, I tell you, that's a... Now we know we're in the shop. The rest is running. When you eat, sleep, and drink that stuff, your your daytime job starts to suffer. 
So you have to say, eh, what am I going to do? Well, there wasn't enough money to go full time with it. So yes, I got to be a crew chief for a while. And yes, I got to do engines for them on the thing. And uh, yes, have I raced my own? Yes. I had some, uh, and I think it's 1973 when the uh, Kawasaki produced a, their 900cc, you know? Mm -hmm. The, you said 1973 Kawasaki. I think it might have been 73. It's a 900cc on it. It's called a, and it was a uh, four cylinder overhead cam. Man, it was a fast motorcycle. Wow. And it would get you hurt. So, well, we naturally had to have one of them. <laughs> and so we raced that thing for a long time. Put a wheelie bar on it and 100 millimeter Makuni carburetors and on and on. It's like, it's like typical hot rod. We yeah. go a little faster, a little faster, a little faster. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, and it's like anything else, you know, you, you go and you break apart and then you fix that and you go to the break apart. And even then, I think we had some uh, nine second time slips, which that's a long time ago, back in the 70s. A nine second time slip was, that's moving. you stand on top of the world. Right. And now then, you go buy one out of the showroom and they run that. Now, now it's what, it, five second, right? Well, you know, <laughs> you can go buy now a stock motorcycle and they'll run in the nines, which that's... That's incredible, but you know that's the advancement of technology through the years. And and would I like to have another? Yes. And are we working on some? Yes. So, uh, but it won't be no more motorcycles. No, I'm too old for that. Yeah. So it's to have a, uh, something to go to the drag strip on it, and either run an ETs or whatever on it. Just participate. You know, mm -hmm. you want to be in the mix. Are you got visions or dreams of winning a big championship? No. 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 Participate. I mean, the drag strip right over there. So you could even drive your car over there. Mm -hmm. And then if it breaks, well, walk home and get the trailer on the truck. You know? yep. <laughs> but yeah, it? that's that's what I want to do. That's, what is the favorite your favorite car or motorcycle you've ever owned? The Cow had to be the first. I had lots of Triumphs and all through the years, but I think the Cow might have been the favorite. Uh, one I wanted but couldn't afford. Uh, Honda made a six cylinder motorcycles. I think it was around 1,047 cc's and it's set this way, you know, six cylinders. And it was so wide, they had to locate the uh, uh, alternator all behind the engine. And it was a it was a fancy motorcycle. You put a single pipe on it and it sounded, and what a sound it made, you know. And, but they were expensive then, they're even more expensive now. But I guess the 900 cal for an all round one you could afford and everything, that'd be it, yeah. Yeah. And, then for cars, you know, I like the mid-years Camaros. I like those uh, for a, seems like for a inexpensive race car. Let's take the Fox Body Mustang. Yeah, they're quick. Put short your wheelbase. LS awesome. in it. It's got a good short wheelbase on the thing. It's got, uh, it's kind of compact. You've got uh, all the brackets and everything. You put an LS in it with a power glide pretty quick. Sorry, four guys up there. that. <laughs> And uh, put you uh, leave the rear end in if it's got an eight eight or get a nine inch either one they're great, and makes you a good let's go racing race car. Are the LSs your favorite engines? It is now. I used to the small blocks like this, yeah, and the big blocks on the thing that was my favorite. But you know, it seemed like when they gathered the Chevrolet engineers up, they said, "Okay, guys, enough of this. We're right. gonna we got to have an engine here that's modern." Mm -hmm. And got lots of, and they they changed a lot, you know. Opened up the cam bore. I mean, this they really went at it. So now then, a high horsepower cheap thing. Go buy you a junkyard motor, put your turbo on it. Keep your horsepower between somewhere between seven hundred to a thousand. And I know you can get more. I understand it on there, but seven hundred to a thousand, and you're pretty safe in that area. Race it for a long time, and then build you another one, or go get another one from the junkyard. Right, dream car. Oh my, boy, that's hard to say. Wow. I don't know. I don't know what would be the, would that be an open-ended thing where if someone said, okay, you can have your own dream car, what is it? Oh. I know, I, it's, it is, is that a realistic it, thing? Yeah. It is not, it is, mm. for us car guys, it's definitely not a realistic oh, question. Man, be, oh. Let's put it like this, if you could have one car if you had fifty thousand dollars to spend on one car, what would you go get? Well, I'd finish. I've got a '55 Chevrolet out here that's in the getting ready to work on its stage. Yeah. I'd finish that to a lot of different ways that I want to do one, 
and uh, try to stay within that budget. But you'd have to be careful and stay within that budget. But that'd be a, it wouldn't be a pristine show car. I mean, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a junker either. It'd have a, it'd have a good paint job. The drivetrain would be dependable, somewhere in the eight to 1200 horsepower range and have it probably a two seater and street legal. I want to say street legal, have a tag on it, of course. Florida and legal. We'll put it Florida legal, okay? <laughs> yeah, doesn't let's, say much. let's put it Florida legal on the thing. <laughs> and uh, that'd, be, uh, that'd be, that'd be probably it, yeah. You know, and I've owned many, many, many different ones. I've owned Supras and uh, Buick uh, Grand Nationals and all that stuff, you know, but uh, cars you regret selling, yeah, the Grand National, I regret that, the Supra, yeah, the... The, the list goes on and on, but hey, it's past tense. We live now, not then. And but that'd be, and that may be my next project car is to do this one here, and put a lot of stuff on it that you've always wanted to put on one, and uh, just use it for a, uh, and not be afraid to use it. Right. You know, if it's raining, you want to go to town then, it's okay. jump in it and go. Yeah. Because I, I don't want no more trailer queens, man. Or just I just don't want no more trailer queens, because they're like, oh no, That's where I'm sunshine. Looking. Oh no. Okay, we'll drive it around the block. Oh no, I see a rain cloud. Take it on. No, I don't. That's what I want to be able to do with my my Mustang. Is hey, you want to go to brunch? Take my fiance to brunch in the car and enjoy a nice day. Jump the windows in the and, car. I mean, that's right? that's what I want is to have it to where that if you say okay, we're at a car show, we're, we've driven somewhere, and it's in the Florida summer rains. Okay, it's raining. Yeah. So what? Wait. Windshield wipers work good, go home. Right. And if it gets wet, well, hey, it won't melt. And neither would you. So, but I, I've had yeah. I've had them trailer queens and they're just make you nervous. Like, oh no, no, don't let people touch it. Don't do this. No. no. Right. My, when I finish the 55, if someone wants to touch it, go ahead. Don't scratch it. But I mean, if you want to touch it, go ahead. That's what it's for. Yeah. And, and where they can look around, look in and see what you've done. Right. What other passions have you had in your life besides cars and racing oh you know I always I wanted to know about the uh, machining industry i.e. tool and die and how to how to work metals yeah you know the, the composition of metals you know when you look at something you say well wonder how they made that and I know they got TV shows for that but you think wonder how they made that and what does it do how do you machine something like that? How do you grind it? I can, I'm and, right there with you. And to know about those, yeah. you know, say when you take a surface grinder, like one of these over here. Right. What can you do with that thing on it? What can you do this? When you take, not that people care, when you make something like that, you know, it's just a square. Mm -hmm. But to make something like that, and it takes you a lot of time, but when you've got that made, it's like, okay, you could have went and bought one for X, but when you've made it and you know the composition of the metal and you want to pick a metal that, not going to move around under stress and duress. That, that's so. I always wanted to know about that. So I went to, I took years of machining, and then tool and die, and then worked in a tool and die shop just to see how they do some of these things. And I think if if more people knew that the basis of this country, uh, our quote industrial revolution was that the machining and tool and die industry, that's how we got the basis of a lot of stuff we have. It's an interesting, interesting trades, you know, and, and yeah, you get a little dirty on the thing, but it's, it's good trades, good, real good trades to have. Mm -hmm. That'd be, that, that was one of the curiosities that I had early on to say, what, how do they do that? How did they do that? You know, just, you look at somebody and think, how'd they make that? Yeah. You know, and then like, you know, sometimes we mistakenly call this an Allen wrench. It's actually, so you don't offend anybody, it's called, it's a hex key. Wrench. Ah. So, because if you call it an Allen wrench and their name's not on it, yeah, taken away. It's a hex key wrench. I can't wait to show you. I need to bring one of my kits home from mm -hmm. work because you know, placing dental implants, you're essentially drilling and tapping a hole. You okay. know, very good, right? Very and you use a hex key like this. <laughs> okay. That's one millimeter in size. <sighs> You know, or less, right? Yeah. Zero point eight or one point two, yeah. depending on the brand mm -hmm. for the company that makes the implants. And they all piece together. I think you'd really be interested in it. I'll show it to you. Oh, I'm, it's just, yes, yes. And to, like sometimes people say, okay, uh, 
hand me a piece of that scotch bright. Now I mention I only say that because it's their trade name. And they say, hand me a piece of that scotch bright, and you hand them one, and they refer to it as that. Well, you can't because it's non-woven abrasive material. Now then you've not offended them, you've not invoked their name or nothing. And it's and it's like when you say Velcro, mm -hmm. no, that's a trade name. Now it's a it, yeah, the Velcro is a trade name. It's a it's a hook and loop. Now then you can use those as common terminology, but you can't say, "Oh, that's Velcro." It's like calling a skid loader a bobcat. They're not all bobcats. No bobcats, are they? <laughs> and it's you know, and you want to say, "Okay, it's a hook and loop," and that's the two go together on the thing. Yeah, so right. that's it. Machining, tooling, tap and die, drill. And you've been welding. Yeah, and 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 it's stuff that it's it's, it's the I guess the mechanical thing, you know, is to what makes those things do that. And now then, the thing I want to do next is to learn about uh, electrical and electronics and tuning. Oh, the tuning, yeah, the tuning. It's like is such really... a it's such a black art, but I want to I want to learn that. And we, I'm I'm learning as well. And now know. we've got access to the best tuners. You know, we've got access to them. We do. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Sure do. You know, it's funny. I, when I started, oh, I bought my car in April mm -hmm. and I, I knew how to put on like your K9 air mm -hmm. filter, you know, or plug in things to an OBD2 or, you know, do some stereo wiring, but I knew nothing about race cars. <laughs> and so I, I mean, the only way to learn is by jumping in and doing it. You got it. And the thing of it is, you know, it, this, you're not going to, this gets to where you're going to hurt yourself, but if you break something, so well, okay, that will break. What did I do wrong? Well, I've done this. Okay, fine. I think one of the and, funniest things that I ever did with my wiring was I, I got the whole car wired up. First time I wired these race fuel pumps on the mm -hmm. front of the car, I turned them on, and the wires started smoking and all caught on fire <laughs> because I didn't have relays, right? I had it hooked straight to the uh, batteries of the switch and oh, learned my lesson there. Oh, my. It's like now then you say, I know what is like on these. I know what's inside of that wire. Yeah, really? What? Smoke. Go hook it up wrong, and it'll smoke on you. That's exactly what's There's in there. Smoke inside the wire. Yeah, wires. smoke inside there. Yeah. Right. Do you prefer a rotary or a DA polisher for detail work? Well, now here's what you have. You have a. Uh, here's your terminology. You have a. People say, let's get the buffer out. Okay. Now the buffer simply means that you've got. A fixed spindle with your buffing pad rotating around it. That's a buffer. Now then you call, you've you got a polisher, and that's usually a RA, or random, or RO, random orbital. Uh, people, it's many different names. But what it does, it has two patterns. It goes around, and it has a random pattern. Mm -hmm. Now what'll happen when you're using a, quote, buffer, because it is, you know, one, you, as you go along here, it leaves its footprint. Come back and lose its footprint. And you'll have people say, oh, mine don't leave that. They do. Well, th it has to. I'm, no, no cut to the person in their, in their integrity, but it has to leave that because it has no choice but to leave that. No matter right. if you're good or bad or whatever on the thing. Mm -hmm. Because you're, you're, you've got a fixed panel, part rotating around it, and you run it this way or this way or this way or this way. It's still the same. Fixed spindle rotating around it, and it leaves a footprint or a line. What do you want to call it? Right. Your random orbital, when you come, it yes, it goes around, but it has this pattern of this. It, it never does the same thing twice. Huh? Right. So that's your, that's what you have then for your your, and when and people when they're referring to it to say, let's get the let's get the buffer out, and they hand a random orbital here. Wait a minute, just get a terminology right, and you won't hurt one. Use it with a random orbital, but you can you can mess up some paint with a high speed. <laughs> yeah. Whew. We've all seen it. Oh, we've seen lots. oh be like, okay, that's uh what's our next step? Call the paint shop. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's usually what happened though. What is the fastest car you've driven? A, a friend of mine had a, a Supra that he wanted me to build him an engine, a thousand horsepower. That was a, that was the criteria. And some friend of ours downtown had a dyno, mm -hmm. built it, and sure enough, it did. So then, over at, um, oh, between Naples and Miami, they were going to put an airport in there. 
and uh, I guess the two chambers of commerce couldn't agree or whatever, but they already had a runway forward. Well, for a while, they would let you rent that, and our, our club rented it one time, and it was, it was a mile, yeah. and you run your car on that mile. And uh, probably in the one, 192, 193, something like that, which they don't, people say, oh, now they're running 220 and 230. I understand. But you get up around, when you go past 150, you, you go to wondering about parts in your car. Yeah. My tire's good. This, wheel bearings, that's it. And you get up around 170, you think, whew, go to hear all kind of noises, you know. I, can I drive this thing okay? And I'd say about 192 is about as fast as I've been on the thing. And me at the, con, at the controls. Right. Huh? And have I been faster with people in cars? Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, it'll make you... <laughs> it makes you wonder about the guy. You think, is he really a good driver? Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Every time. Because you, you're doing 70 or 80, you think, yeah, ho hum. You fall out here, we're, we're okay. But it makes you pull the belts tighter when you, the yeah. you go like that. Let me cinch up a little tighter. It does. So, yeah. Do you ever see yourself racing again? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, goodness sakes, yes. Yes. You know, I won't be in a, something like a Lyle Will in a Pro Mod. It won't be that. But to be in the, Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve second cars on? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah. And you know, there's uh like anything, you when you've been away from it for a while, you, you come back in the twelves and elevens and tens and nines. You don't just go from where I'm right now, just jump into an eight second car. I mean you could, and it'll it'll check your reflexes. And you want to get everything get you situated back into it. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Being a spectator's nice, that that's fine. But every once in a while, you want to sit down behind the wheel and say, okay, yeah. That was probably my biggest shock is when I first got my car, you know, it was built for, it was built for, you know, grudge racing, mm -hmm. street mm -hmm. racing, right? Had a bunch of weight in the back. Mm -hmm. Got it first time I did a 12, you know, and then the next fast I did an 11. And then I think I skipped 10s all together and went straight to 9s <laughs> and then 8s. <laughs> it's, it's, it'll suck the soul out of you going. And you know, what is... Uh, when, when the first time you've raced on slicks, you know, it, you, you think, ooh, it's getting kind of squashing around here, you know. But it, that's the nature, because it's not got a real stiff, a slick doesn't have a real stiff sidewall on the thing, you know. So when you when you run it at speed, it expands and it becomes taller, if you will. But you have a little thin, like a one or two ply sidewall. And when it, you know, it's... It it's amazing to when you go around a corner in a car with slicks on it, right? And you feel the whole thing roll over. Oh, it just, it's like, is this thing going to roll over here and die right. or something? And then you put a radio on the car and it drives like a truck, you know? Yeah, it's exactly. completely different. Exactly. Blew my yeah. mind. Totally different. And and I would say that's probably, a, well, it had to be some in the, in the thinking on it, is when you had the radio race tires, you know? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people were crashing cars for their first time on slicks. Because it does feel like you're on something slick. It, it feels does. like driving on ice or something. Oh, yeah. Because you, it, it makes you think, we're out of control here. Yeah. And for a lot of them, it was out of control. But your radio puts, because it got enough sidewall in it, and you got enough tack on it here, uh, sticking it to stick to the surface. It, it, it's, it's drivable, okay? Very right. drivable. But when you're going just to a straight slicks, whew, it will it get your heart rate up. Yeah, sure will. It's like, dang, we're going to... And, and then what a lot of guys would do is when you when you're on slicks and you come up and you get up to speed on the thing and and you want to correct it a little bit on the thing no don't do it because ain't no comeback because you correct over here and it goes here and then pretty soon it's like whoa, whoa. that happened to me on my last day of race week you know I'm going down you do the wheel like this and the whole car oh, will man, jump it's it just, scary it and, and like I say it makes your your heart rates it way did. up there it's like oh this it's exciting that was when after that I immediately switched back to a radial tire yeah yeah. Good but, you know, Good one day. of those things you learn and as you keep doing it. Well, like I say, sometimes you win, sometimes you learn, you know. Well, I think that's a lot of the, okay. the good questions on here. Okay. I think that was fun. That was... But see, we, did, we didn't infringe on anything. And there's... Uh, and people would say, let me look it up and see if he done that. Sure, it's all... It's a record somewhere. Yeah. Uh, you go back to the UNCA in Asheville. There I am in that. Uh, you go to any of the other stuff on it, and there it only is. So, yeah, you want to. And if I could look inside my head, they'd see where I'm serious about the 
the community that I'm in now. Yeah. Oh, you said you're, this is living your dream, right? This, this is it because if you think about it, you, you don't want to die with a pocket full of dreams, right? Because it makes a real before their death, it makes a real grouchy, uh, sour faced person on it. It does. If you can set your goals, your dreams, realis realistically speaking, and when those start to come true, it it takes your heart rate up too. But like where I'm at today, I mean, it's the greatest bunch of people that you could be around because it's hot runners. It's people that, it's, it's a, to steal one of their terms, it's a kindred spirit because you, automatically when you go up to a crowd of them on a thing and you listen to it, it's common language, you know? It is, yeah. It's just, it's just common stuff, you know? And you know exactly what they're talking about right then. And when you share something, they're like, oh yeah. So it's not like you're going up there talking complete foreign language of something like, no. It, it's just, I don't know, it's, uh, I always liked that. That was the unique thing about it was when you sat down with a bunch of racers, drag racers, engine builders, whatever one thing, it's, common you you can be immediately in you know that mm -hmm. that's you know it's like when you when you drive the car and somebody says hey it does this or this you know exactly where it is and exactly what they're talking about and it's not like well, let me study that no you're already there so is it a dream yeah is it the realization of it yeah oh yeah you wait all these years and you think and it's i don't know how else to explain it when you when that comes to you uh, you say, you go to sleep at night and you think, it's here. It, and then when you wake up in the morning, it's like, it's really here. Yeah. And, and and you know, you're thinking, well, you're acting like an eight-year-old. No, anything big that you accomplish in your life, it was something he's just really after, okay? So let's say he's really after it. And, and it finally comes around. You'll get giddy about it. I don't care what it is. Mm -hmm. Because it's just, that's just the way we are as humans. And when something like this comes around, it's like, that's amazing. And where I'm at right now is this, it's the epicenter of it. It really is. It is. And, and, and you know, you, I don't, I don't know how else to explain it because you, it's one of them things, yeah, you'd have to be there. But when you're, it's, people say, well, you have to be in the element. Well, you are in the element. And that's the thing about you're in it. Mm -hmm. And, and to explain that to somebody, they're like, hey, you're crazy. Yeah. yeah, probably. But that's, that's the part that you've waited on. You think, yes, it was worth the wait. And and that's what you ask, have to ask yourself. Was it really worth it? Oh, yeah. 100%. 100% of that. As of this week, it's here for you. Oh, man. And, I can, <laughs> and this, starting off this new year, 2022, with, uh, it's, it's like a, a big 100-pound weight. You just took me and went, whew, just yeah. set it off. And said, okay, now then we begin. And it's, wow. What are your goals for this year? Some of the one, the, the big one is to, and this, and, and I've got it written down, I've, I've, I've had it written for a long time, is to really be involved in this community. And you're saying, well, you are now. No, I mean really involved to where you, you share knowledge, yes, but you want to learn the things that you've been missing out on. Yeah. And you go to the people. It's like, you know, the access we have now, we have fabricators, welders, Electric got just at a, at a touch. Yeah. Now you have to pick your times. You don't want to take them away from their duties, but you have access to it. Mm -hmm. That's in, that's incredible. I think this year is going to be amazing. Isn't that's it? just you know, and I'm, and a lot of people are going to look at it and say, "That guy's too old to be doing that." No, I, you know, you, you set your your goals and the things you want to do in relation to your abilities, and when you've done that. Uh, it you can you can do what's in there. You can do what's in there. Yeah. And I, oh, it's probably to me. It's the one thing that when that alarm goes off in the morning, a lot of times I'm waiting for it to go off. It's like, man, we get to be in it today. Go, and man. you think about that. You get to be in it today. Yeah. And I know people look at you sometimes. They think yeah, you're a little bit crazy. Yeah, I know. But but still, when you get to live your dream because you hear people in Florida say, oh, just living the dream. Well, they say it for a joke, but, but when you get to live in and live your dream, what more you got? I mean, that's what you've been waiting for. It is. And it's there. It's like, 
and it's everything that I expected that it would be. Mm-hmm. Everything. Good. You know, it's everything I expected. As a fellow car guy, I know it's super easy to forget to take care of yourself, especially when you're at the track. We're all drinking Mountain Dew and Dr. Pepper. This toothbrush is only $39. It's a great electric toothbrush. It's what I use every day. Normally they're $59, but if you click the link in the description below or use my coupon code QDNASK, you can get this toothbrush for only $39. Buy one for yourself, your girlfriend, whoever. They are an awesome toothbrush. It's basically the same thing as a Sonicare except a tenth of the price. So go get one. They send you a new brush out every three months so you don't have to worry about it. It's a great deal.